Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Can I feel that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. A lot of killers. Why you think our country so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Welcome to Varm Blog, and today we're talking to the Strange Matters co-editors, Steve Mann and John Michael Colon. Um, and we're talking in interesting times, but that'll come at the end. Um, right now, we're going to focus in on MMT and its limits. Um, although we will touch on certain current controversies around the subject, such as inflation, uh, deflationary pressures, uh, stuff like that, that'll come up later, um, particularly in the context of what seems to be an increasingly globally tense world. Um, so... Let us begin. Um, we are going to have to lay out a lot of groundwork here, though, because I don't know how much of the audience is familiar with all the technical um, distinctions that are going to come up. I would suggest um, that our audience goes back and looks up on their own things like Michael Hudson's uh, super imperialism. Um, Kristen Dawson's uh, constitutionalist work, as well as the blog of Colin Drum, which will all be relevant today. But uh, would you two like to introduce yourselves in more detail? Yeah, sure. So first of all, Varn, thanks for having me on the show again, and um, and Steve. Um, so we're co-editors of a new literary magazine called Strange Matters, which is not just about economics. It's going to be coming at a whole lot of different uh, interesting topics, both kind of across practical, political, and political economy concerns, uh, you know, in its first half uh, called the front pages uh, that come from our kind of like libertarian socialist perspective, but then also topic, you know, tackle huge topics like, uh, you know, political economy and the history of economic thought and uh, theories of democratic self-management, that kind of thing. And then the back pages, we're going to have a culture, philosophy, journalism, general kind of little magazine. Um, and this project that we're kind of discussing is a book extract uh, from a book that Steve and I wrote together that is going to be um, published separately as an essay in the magazine, um, which uh, the magazine launches tomorrow. Uh, and the uh, and the, the essay is going to be forthcoming in the next, I actually forget exactly when it is uh, the date, but it's in sometime in the next few weeks as we kind of like do our fundraiser, we're going to be dropping articles. And the Forex article is going to be one of the first ones. And uh, Steve and I both come from a kind of like MMT milieu. We were both uh, basically just like uh, uncritical partisans of the theory for a long time. But we started kind of realizing that there were these gaps in its story, which although its story is, in our view, more realistic than the story of mainstream economics, um, it does have these these uh, these problems. And it turns out that when you pull those threads, uh, a whole lot unravels. Not the whole thing, I would argue, uh, but enough that you need kind of like at, at the very least an auxiliary theory and that theory changes things so much that maybe it's a new theory. We don't even know really what we are. Uh, but um, we're tentatively calling it the theory of forex, and that's what we want to talk about. I think your viewers already know who I am. I'm a writer, journalist. I've written for the the Point, Brooklyn Rail, um, in these times, and a couple other places. And uh, but uh, I'll let you, my co-editor and co-author introduce himself. Yeah, hi. Uh, my my name is Steve Mann. This is my first time on the program, so thanks for having me. Uh, I'm a co-editor of Strange Matters magazine, like John mentioned. Um, I studied economics at the New School, um, 
many years ago at this point. Um, the master's program there, and I, I'm a co-editor and the co-author of the upcoming book of which Forex is a chapter, like you mentioned. Um, yeah, uh, I also have a piece on that's sort of reframing the recent inflation debates by going back to theory and reformulating them and kind of extending them, but in a different direction from sort of the like demand demand pull versus cost push sort of like interminable struggle and uh, <laughs> try, to, try to get out of that. So that will be coming out along with, if not the first week, then soon of our campaign, our fundraiser campaign on Indiegogo, which lasts through March. Okay. So for a little context before we begin, I want to talk about my understanding of chartalism and MMT. You know, chartalism comes out of uh, actually explicitly Lasalle and socialism, and in the early debates around the All German Workers League, um, and it was debates between Marx and Lasalle over the independence of the law. Um, this became an inspiration to uh, Knapp, who did a fairly empirical study of 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 money and came to the conclusion. It was basically a closed system, somewhat dependent on the state, um, that it was a creation, quote, of the state. This was revised by Michelle Inez, uh, who saw money as a actually creation of credit. But these theories are kind of dropped, except in brief passing in Keynesian writers, uh, such as Keynes himself, and then later on Marvin Minsky. Now, when I first was introduced to MMT in the early aughts, it was associated not with the MMTers we know now, but actually with the most radical forms of heterodox Keynesianism around Minsky. Um, even though that was not a fair view, that was how it was generally presented. During the same time period, you had um, Bill Mitchell, Warren Mosler, the um, uh, Stephanie Kelton being the most famous and influential, but often Nathan Tankis, et cetera, start to really articulate a more cohesive second vision for what neo chartalism and MMT really was. The attacks on MMT, though, came early on, partly having to do with Brexit and the seeming impossibility of Giannis's Varoufakis's various plans and Syriza. But then it sort of faded into the background and built a popular movement online where even more serious, even centrist economists were beginning to take it somewhat seriously. Now, there's also other theorists who contributed to this process, Fred Lee and Michael Hudson. Uh, Michael Hudson had been an economic historian and it kind of came up with his own theory of super imperialism, which rhymed with the theories of uh carl kowski and j.a hobson but wasn't exactly the same um about the independence of of state credit money and it was hudson and david graber's uh book about debt which developed a sort of interest in the deep anthropology of money in the popular consciousness um now again this kind of happened 2010 to 2013, during the ascension of Occupy and the publishing of the book Debt. Now, I have my criticisms of Graeber and always have, and I'm sure they'll come up today. But we need to understand, I guess, uh, the, the deep history. I was convinced by Graeber's research, more than Graeber's book, actually, that that the chartalist had a point about internal debt and credit systems and that, that they preceded barter. But then there is this great gap that I had no idea how that had happened. I knew that, for example, barter for, for light goods was actually common between, not between individuals or proprietors in these early societies, but between competing, not bands, actually. This, we don't know that it happened that early, but between agricultural societies. Um, but... I couldn't figure out why on earth would one agricultural society accept another agricultural society's debt tokens. Um, 
And I had another question. While there have been plenty of societies that have been on paper money, in the Eurasian context in particular, there have been more societies that have been on metal coinage than anything else. And that it was crucial to political developments in late Roman antiquity and the Greek city-states, etc. And I could not explain that or reconcile it with MMT's story. Furthermore, in the contemporary context, MMT years, at least in their early phases, tended to treat economies as autarkies, as if they existed as totally self-sufficient internal things dependent on the state, and that the state could somehow backdoor set prices and all kinds of things that I had seen little evidence for. During the when I first heard this, I actually lived through Egypt's uh hyperinflation when it tried to float its currency to meet impositions put on it by not only the IMF, but also China. Um, and to quit fixed rate, uh, and to quit its fixed rate exchange, which led to a crisis which was slowly ameliorated in the Egyptian context, but it's still kind of being ameliorated. So it's, I had a hard time buying the story that I was hearing from the people advocating it as a way out in the Grexit context. And then it became popular online, which is usually the doom for us all. So, um, you guys came up with a theory that started to deal with some of the things I had offhandedly observed in my ad hoc criticisms of MMT before. I had admitted that the MMTers had a better story of the early origins of, of debt and credit and thus of fiat and credit money than anything like I'd heard from the Marxists who'd accepted the classical economic positions. And that I also had seen that there were hints of stuff like chartalism in some of Marx's writings in the Grundessa and, and, and so forth. So there was other things that hinted at it, but Marx never finished anything. So I don't know why we expected him to finish this. Um, so this leads us to your theory. Let's state out what you think is at hand and why we have to talk about these ancient economies that we have only scant archaeological evidence for. Why do we have to start there? And then let's start there. Yeah, the, I mean, the, thank you for that introduction. It was it was very thorough. I think um, this stuff is very complicated because it turns out that theories of money are not unlike, you know, say scientific theories in like, you know, physics or something like that, uh, or biology. These controversies are not kind of like neatly laid out with different schools and positions that, you know, you can then kind of like study, but in fact are kind of inter incoherently interwoven throughout all these different like economic systems um, that people create for other reasons. And then they attach their theory of money to it as an afterthought. And as a result, you have people with these different intuitions mixing and matching them, even if they're mutually exclusive, uh, unaware or, you know, or dissimulating about how aware they are about the history of previous debates on the question and blah, 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 blah. And it's a total mess. And in fact, not the piece that we're talking about today, but another piece that we wrote is actually trying to kind of untangle the history of um, the family of theories of which MMT is a part, which are called chartalist theories. And they're basically uh, theories of money as a token that can be made of anything and is issued. And the thing that gives it its value is the fact that people have to pay obligations in it and can pay it in nothing else. That theory of money, I mean, there's some people who argue that it goes all the way back to Plato. Um, but it's uh, because he has um, in a dialogue a, a notion of money as a totally arbitrary token. Uh, but then like, you know, the real modern theory of it starts with two thinkers, one of whom is, as you mentioned, Knopp, who was the Prussian militarist bureaucrat in the 19th century, who his day job was figuring out how to make the Prussian Empire more big and powerful, and he developed this more or less empirical account of how a fiat currency works uh, in the 19th century, but uh, basically generalized it, saying that all money is a creature of the state. That's a state theory of money. Um, there was this other guy who was a British diplomat in the early 20th century called Mitchell Inns, who also had a, a chartalist theory. He seems to have invented it separately from Knopp, uh, and his version is interesting because although he does talk about state issuances as being just tokens that are circulated and received back, he also talks about 
um, issuances by private actors like uh, like banks, uh, for example, as being arbitrary issuances that are that circulate and are received back in loan repayments. So his theory, he called it instead of a state theory of money, he called it a credit theory of money. Um, both are basically chartalist theories because the core thing in chartalist theory is that money is this token uh, that is poofed into existence, circulates, and is received back rather than this thing that exists in a pile out there in society and it's scarce to everybody uh, and everybody's just fighting over how to divvy it up and you never ask about where it comes from, um, which is kind of like the, a, a, an ungenerous summary of the mainstream theory. Um, the, it has nuances, but that's kind of the picture that you get in neoclassical economics. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because the, the, the MMTers, modern monetary theory, is actually a brand that was developed on the blogs. In the, uh, in the original academic texts, they actually call themselves neo-chartalists. And the characteristic uh, of neo-chartalism is that this whole history of Knopp and Mitchell Inns and their influence on Keynes and other radical Keynesian economists of the 1930s and 40s was lost. This whole history was suppressed when the neoclassicals took uh, control of the economic departments after the war, basically. Um, and then it had to be kind of rediscovered by these folks in the 90s, like uh, uh, Randy Ray and Bill Mitchell and Stephanie Kelton, and they call themselves the neo chartalists And they basically took the credit theory of money of, uh, of, uh, of Randy Ray and the state theory of money of Mitchell Inns and basically just said, no, this is the same theory. And it's all like, you know, because, and it all ultimately is kind of organized under the state theory. Like at the end of the day, they agreed with Knopp that money is fundamentally a creature of the state. Um, and even when a private actor like a bank uh, poops money into existence through issuing loans, which by the way is how they do it. The loans don't come out of uh, people's savings that they, that they kept at the bank. Uh, the bank actually, every time that it issues a loan, it basically just creates new money. But they can only do that because they have a license uh, given to them by the state. So at the end of the day, the, 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 the buck stops with the state. The state spends money into existence uh, when it does state projects or through its agents like the banking system. It circulates uh, and then it's received back when people pay back their taxes and that's what money is, which means that the state can't run out of it. Uh, and that has radical implications according to the MMTers. Um, so that would be roughly the history as I would describe it. It's a little more complicated too. There's questions about what, whether Minsky was actually a chartalist, even though it's very important to the self-conception of the MMTers that he was. There's also questions about who's in the club and who's not, especially since some of these ideas circulated far wider than people who self-identified as chartalists. Um, and sometimes people mix and match them incoherently with other ideas from other theories. So it's a huge mess. Uh, no less an authority than Schumpeter, who, uh, whose history of economic thought was very, very influential, basically complains at one point that the history of theories of money was basically incomprehensible and even he can't reconstruct it. Um, the, but that roughly would be our kind of potted story of it. Right. Now, let's compare this to the classical... Um, theory of money and then maybe the neoclassical theory of money real fast like the classical theory of money as represented by the first volume of capital volume of Karl Marx or Wealth of Nations is that commodity exchange needed a standardization um, through barter you needed an abstract way to count stuff thus you um, found a commodity which had um, relatively of relative scarcity, metal works best for that. It's hard to manipulate, hard to reproduce. Um, you can control it, and poof, there you go. There you have money. It emerges from barter. Um, now, you know, I will actually say that I don't know that Karl Marx actually believed that was the true or only theory of money. He writes about other kinds of money. Uh, he specifically refers to that as commodity money as opposed to. Um, credit money and there's a talk about state monies what we would call fiat money in some in uh in some cases in marx um okay so there's that narrative now i'm actually not sure what the neoclassical theory of money is if it even has one um uh, it seems like it may be the classical theory but i don't know and there are a lot of people who claim that Keynesians are all secret chartalists, um, which I also don't know if that's true or not either, even though I've read Keynes 
multiple times. So um, how do we answer these questions? <laughs> Steve, I defer to you since you have the, uh, the uh, yeah, Keynes, Keynes flirted with chartalism for sure. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote a book called How to Pay for the War, which was his advice to the the government on literally that in actually really that it was how to provision for the war using knowledge that you have a fiat currency that you can use to develop you can use to control and provision you need without reference where the budget might be so you care about the biophysical resources of the economy and um, if there's inflation, then you can like um, issue to soak up people's purchasing power so that they don't um, bid up prices in, in his in his uh, construction of things. But yeah, so he's he sort of flirted with the idea, but then that got lost from his his intellectual um, in the academy. Many of them who like took those ideas really seriously and developed them along the chartalist lines got um, literally purged out of the academy during like the Red Scare. Right. Yeah. And it's in terms of, um, you know, what the mainstream story is, it's interesting because, I mean, to the extent that neoclassicals talk about money at all, usually it's because they were forced to. Like, they, they, they usually prefer to actually just kind of make money and banking disappear from their models. Um, at least, like, the most orthodox neoclassicals. Some of them are kind of sneaking some of this stuff back in uh, because, for example, you can't explain 2008 without something like a Minskian crisis theory. Um, so, you know, now some of it is starting to come back in, but it doesn't fit into the main model. It's basically a totally separate module that's never been properly integrated. Um, when they do when they are forced into little scenarios at the beginning of their textbooks or in like a historical book to talk about the origins of money, they'll usually draw on either Adam Smith's barter story or on the, uh, or on the equivalent from the Austrians, like, um, like von Mises and, and stuff like that, which is, as you described it, where people are like, you know, trading basically, uh, in order to, uh, like, you know, you have, you give haircuts, I have chickens. How 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 many haircuts uh, can I get for a certain amount of chickens? You know, and then I give you two, I don't know, two chickens and you give me the haircut. Um, you know, and we're all doing this with all our products, yeah. you know, which by the way are never produced, we just have them, right? And then like eventually it's like, wow, this is a real pain in the butt. Uh, what if we just picked one of them and we decided that everything was gonna be uh, a certain number of that thing. And then people were like, great, so what should we do that with? And it's like, oh, well, we'll do it with silver uh, or gold or with, uh, you know, whatever. And it always ends up being gold and silver for mysterious reasons. Uh, and that's like the story of, of how money started. Um, first big problem with that is that we look at the earliest societies and you're, you don't have what are called spot payments. like. I'm not trading you. Trade as such, actually, I personally, the way that I would interpret things is that trade doesn't exist. Exchange in the way that neoclassical theory often talks about that isn't really a thing. At least this is how I keep it in my head. Like, because it's not just that we're bartering things and money is disguising that through this superficial thing. Instead, what's happening is totally different. Um, because if you look at these early, uh, what are called gift economies, the way that it would actually work is that you just give me the haircut. Like in our first interaction, I'm like, I need a haircut. And you're like, okay. And then you give me the haircut. And then, I mean, it wouldn't be a haircut. It would be something else, but you get, you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. And then there is, that puts me in your debt because you gave me something without me giving you something. So that means that I owe you something, right? I owe you one buddy. And then you're going to call that debt in at some point. Uh, and that's not up to me. That's up to you because you're the creditor of the debt, right? So really Gift economies, gifts sound nice. You give you give gifts at Christmas or whatever, but no, gift economies are actually more like pure credit economies. Uh, or they they they're it's difficult to characterize them all like that because they don't keep numbers that of like you know precise quantities of what is owed because they don't have that yet, uh, or they've chosen not to have it um, if they see it around them. Oftentimes, although sometimes they do. It's a longer story, but the short version is like I owe you. And in the future, when you decide, usually, 
I will have to repay you something of equal or even greater value. Um, so because I, you gave me a haircut, there is like a class of goods and services that are in that bubble that are w rough, worth roughly the right. same let's say the low end ones. Um, so when you come to my house later and you see this, like, I don't know, um, this cool little thing that's, that's really awesome. You can be like, wow, that's such a nice thing. And in our society, which will we'll have been used to this kind of thing, cause this is how everything is done. When you do that, that's like a sign of like, Oh wow. Like he wants that thing. I owe him this. So I'm going to give it to him. And then our debt is equalized. Uh, so people are constantly kind of getting into these uh, these debt relationships with each other. Now, eventually, what ends up happening is that they start developing instruments by which to kind of quantify this. Um, the that uh, interestingly um, in Mesopotamia, anyway, these are the first instruments that they used to invent language. Uh, the language and the accounting system actually were the same thing, and the accounting system came first. And then, like applying words well, to to those records, kind of came as a secondary. Well, that's how they invented writing. Yeah, it was. Sorry, I should have <laughs> written language. Yeah, yeah. Can, can yeah. I, uh, before we get You're to correct. Mesopotamia, language can I? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, I'm crazy. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. Can, can I pause you for a second? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting is this This actually comports with primatology studies that we've looked at for a long time about reciprocation societies, um, which match with early human gift economies, which we have evidence for. And uh, any society, agricultural hunter-gatherer that has a surplus. Um, but we also see this in immediate return um, hunter-gatherer societies in terms of social exchange, right? Um, and we see this with apes as well and with even things like crows. So you're not even stuck with mammals um, where you have some kind of uh, reciprocation of of favors or exchange or gifts um, between people in a, in a band. So this goes back into like social mammal mm -hmm. basics and, and it doesn't comport with the barter theories that we, that we had. And this is why I found when, when this started being popularized, but when people rediscovered Hudson and, uh, whose book was from the seventies. And, um, when people, when David Gra Graeber wrote his book debt, this was the part of it that I found most convincing because it lined up with primatology research by Francis DeWall and stuff that we've been observing in anthropology going back to Marcel Mauss. I mean, like, so it's, it's, this is not new information for anthropologists, but it was just totally bracketed out and not included into theories uh of money now i'm gonna let you get to mesopotamia which this is hudson's real this is hudson's focus right it's mesopotamia and the ancient near east yeah i talked to less if you wanna sure um so in mesopotamia we had temples issuing credit centrally issued credit to control the flow of resources and later trade between different temples and they needed to they needed a system where you can denominate so we have we have metal money and then we have goods and services and we need we need to be able to denominate them in something but not in the same way that the neoclassicals would say oh we just like money is just this veil that's floating over everything but rather um something they called shekels yeah, and it's important to note that shekels um, are not this thing that is circulating, and all of us are using it to pay for stuff, either to each other or even to the temple. Um, shekels exist purely on the tablet. They're a unit of account. They're, uh, they're literally like a, a measurement, and they're tied into the calendar and the measuring system for like physical measurements. Um, and uh, the way that the temple works is, remember, we're kind of growing this whole system out of the previous gift economy system where everything fundamentally is debt obligations, right? And then what matters is what you can use to discharge the obligation that you've accrued to somebody. Well, the temple starts when somebody, the, for whatever reason, and it's actually unclear why it happened, it seems like it might have been voluntary uh, in the earliest stages, although it quickly became not that. Um, well over quickly as in centuries. Um, everybody basically ended up with an obligation to this temple. 
And once a year, they would have to pay that obligation. Uh, you can think of it as a tax. And for simplicity's sake, I'm going to call it the tax. So you pay your tax to the temple. The temple says you owe a shekel. What the hell is a shekel? It's not any one thing. It's a thing that you use to measure how you can pay the temple. So the shekel, for example, was pegged to a certain amount of grain called a gur, and you could pay your obligation to the temple in a society where everybody is a farmer, right, um, with a gur of grain. That is worth a shekel, and therefore you bring it in at tax time, and they mark you off as having paid it, right? Um, you can also pay the shekel with eight grams of silver. Now, silver... All the evidence indicates that silver didn't circulate at all. And in the normal economy, like between you and me, normal people, we're still in gift economy mode, basically. But when we pay our obligations to the temple, we're integrating ourselves into the shekel system and paying using whatever is worth the number of shekels that we owe. Um, and when you're, and then the silver is for a special class of person who isn't the normal run-of-the-mill people. It's the merchants who the whole way that we got like, you know, creditor elites in the ancient world, these people who are like the merchants, the money lenders, the early bankers, um, those people actually began as like uh, trade, trade agents, essentially, for the temples, because the temples, in order to keep their stuff going, they didn't just need grain, they needed stuff that they didn't make, like tin and copper, which were the building materials, and they were usually far away under the auspices of some other settlement that's kind of like uh, running on the same rules. So they would have these, these merchants, they would give some silver to the merchants, but that silver wasn't just a gift, it was a loan. And then they would say, you owe us back the shekel value of the silver. And that shekel value is uh, you, you can pay it back, not just in silver, you actually have to pay it back in a certain amount of tin and copper, um, which is also priced in shekels. So you can see how shekels are a way of creating prices for different things um, that, you know, that they can then be received as payment to the temple. And then basically they would go to the other city, get the tin and copper, bring it back and pay in some combination of silver and, silver and shekels. And then the silver could be used like anything, any silver that was left over from the trade agents uh, activities abroad, they could just do whatever they wanted with. So, um, and then when they went to that other second city, um, I'm kind of like skipping so that we can, so we can finish the thought, but basically the way that they would buy the tin and copper was with silver because for these transactions between different settlements, silver was basically the way that you would always pay. If you were traveling between places and, uh, and, and making payments in another kind of accounting system, um, the, that accounting system, their, their version of the shekel, um, like, you know, you, you, to get their goods, you would use silver. Um, because everybody received silver um, from people who were moving between the cities. So silver kind of becomes its own unit of account. Like the unit, the first units of account seem really to have been these kinds of like um, they, they, the shekel existed only on only on tablets, right? Only on paper, uh, not circulating paper. I mean, like like accounting books, right? Um, except that they use tablets. But the but silver was used as the in, the let's say uh, inter. It's not international. Well, let's call it inter the, inter elites inter elites of one temple to another. And right, their agents. Yeah. So like it, was it was being used like we can't commensurate shekels between one place and another place that doesn't have the shekels, but we can increasingly do so with silver. Yeah, because if you think about it, our, let's say that we're different countries. My accounting system is going to have prices for a whole bunch of different things. Varn's accounting system is going to have prices for a whole bunch of different things. And those prices are not going to be the same as mine. So grain in my city might be in my shekel system a totally different price than it is in Varn mm -hmm. City. So if somebody from my city wants to go to Varn City, how how and with what do they pay for the grain if the prices are different? The answer is that we both receive silver as a means of payment. So whatever the exchange rate, so to speak, of silver to grain is, is what is like. You have silver in your pocket as the traveler, and then there's a grain price in silver. So you just pay, use the silver to pay, and then you get that amount of grain. So a couple observations, and I, I noticed this when I read your ch uh, chapter as well. This interestingly seems to actually indicate that both the chartalist and the barter theory have some root in 
and truth. And it now makes sense of things that may not have made sense to, to people about, say, ancient, uh, uh, let's say the ancient Mediterranean world. When people would ask me, like, why are there money lenders and currency exchangers at temples in the Bible? And why are all these pagan temples banks? In, in the in the in the ancient Greek world for travel between polises. Now I had known this from my study of classics, but I had no way to explain it with this with the with the uh, things that I was given in either classical um, theories of money or because why on earth would the temples be the centers for this? Like why was that the case? Um, or um, the uh, the, frankly, the neo chartalist theories either, because I was like, well, but these, how do, how do closed systems trade with each other? Clearly they were, particularly when you're talking about, we're, we're not even talking about settlements that can properly be described as developed states. These are, these do not have, I mean, a lot of these places don't have standing armies. Like you basically have temple guards and like private security forces. If we would call them that, what they actually are is more like, Rich dudes pay mercenaries, but um, I think this is very, very interesting because it makes sense of things like little hints of things we see in the historical record of the ancient world between a uh, hundred thousand and two thousand years ago. Um, uh, now, what I also find interesting is none of this would apply to most societies before, say, forty thousand years ago. It just wouldn't. Um, so, so uh, it's also interesting because it means that these reciprocation gift economies are very, very old. They're kind of uh, Graeber makes points about this in, in ways that I kind of think are silly, but are, are not wrong. Um, about how like we have some of this even in like our the way we normally transact our ideas of fairness and all this are based on these reciprocation gift economies. And if you think about it. Um, I don't like evolutionary just so stories, but like it makes sense that if that was the norm for a species for I don't know a couple million years, that it would somehow be ingrained in our in our normal ad hoc developed senses of morality. Okay, that gets us to the Hudson writings and to Graeber's debt stuff. All right, but how is this different from that? Oh well, we're actually basing the story that we just told you on that. So, so far we're fully within the realm of the Graeber Hudson thing. Um, this is basically the story that's in those two sources. Um, the, just to round out the story, the, the, basically this is all the bronze age. The temples eventually do become states because these temple planners start calling themselves Kings and they start conquering each other. That all lasts until the bronze age collapse. Uh, it's, you know, which is when this whole kind of system, like, get blows up for reasons that nobody knows about. Uh, then the axial age basically happens. What we call classical antiquity, but um, Graeber uses the term the axial age because uh, it's a term that was used to describe how the same thing was happening across Eurasia and nobody knows why, but it seems to have had something to do with the rise of very similar social systems. Um, so in this axial age period, which roughly speaking, we're talking about like 400 BCE-ish through to sometimes CE-ish. People usually end it around like All 200. the major religions develop around this time. Yeah. Uh, yes. Richard Seaford does a lot of stuff on this and the changes of uh, even notions of self around economics in this time period, but go ahead. Yeah, so until the period that I'm talking about, all throughout this temple period that we're talking about, there is no circulating uh, means of payment, uh, like, or at least for the general population. I, obviously, these merchant elites who are going from city to city and doing these international transactions, they will tend to price things in silver because that's what's receivable between cities. Most people, they're in gift economy mode when dealing with like the people around them, and they pay the temple in biophysical resources. Circulating money that you and I use to pay each other begins in 400, uh, I actually forget the year, but it doesn't really matter. About, King about, of Lear. 400 and, about 400 BC. Yeah, around thereabouts. And it's the King of Lydia, which is a small kingdom in what is now Turkey. And uh, they invent the first circulating money, which was a silver coin. Why would you do this? Well, it turns out that the state 
created the first coins. And it did so for military purposes because they needed – you would always have this problem when you were traveling between like where you are and where you want to conquer that like how do you get resources out there? You can extend a supply line, but especially in the olden times and especially if there's no sea routes, you're very limited in how long you can practically do that. But you got to feed this army. you got to clothe it. You've got to have, have a place to sleep. So if you're going really far away, how do you do that? Well, usually you couldn't. Um, except by pillage, but then pillage makes it harder to manage whatever territory you conquer because everybody hates your guts even more and will fight against you. So these empires were limited in how much they could expand. But if you put a coin in the soldier's pocket and the soldier goes to the other place, and when they go to an inn, they tell the innkeeper, you have a new king, which is my conquering king, and he, he's going to – you owe him a tax because we're, we conquered you, and now you owe taxes to him. The only way that you can pay this tax is by using this coin that's got his face on it. By the way, we're the army. We need to sleep here somewhere. We'll actually pay you in these coins, and then you can use that to pay the king. So people the, – the, the, the story that is the chartalist story, the MMT story for why this works is that the innkeeper is like, oh, shit – I've got these guys with swords who are like, you know, it's either this or pillaging me. And also I got to pay their king. So I'm going to take the king's money um, and, uh, you know, charge them for this in, in priced in the king's money. Uh, and then that when, when tax time comes around, I can pay the king. This means that conquering armies are spreading the use of coinage to different places because this is the way that they get provisioned, and it is less violent and therefore creates more stability for governance purposes than outright pillage. And on top of it, me, the innkeeper, I've got to get my pork for my pork stew from somebody, right? So um, – the, but the pork stew guy also is going to have to pay uh, taxes to the king, and he's like, uh, wait – I need some of these coins too. So we're not doing gift economy stuff anymore. You need to pay me in these coins that the soldiers gave you because I need to pay my taxes too. Uh, so now they start, instead of doing gift economy stuff, which is how they had been doing stuff previously, they start pricing their goods and services in coins because they want the coins so that they can pay the tax. So an imposed tax obligation is making the coins a desirable means of payment. And the, and, and, this is what causes the use of money in society as a whole um, in order to pay for goods and services. Uh, this theory is called tax receivability or tax-driven money. Tax receivability because the reason why a coin is receivable as payment, according to this story, is because of the tax obligation that was imposed that can only be paid back through this uh, uh, this obligation. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just got a correction. It was the, uh, the five forties, not the, not the 400. Okay. It was, I knew it was in that. that. I forgot. Right. That. And there's also the debate about the, the metal cowrie shells in, in China around like 1100 BC. But, but yeah, I mean, what's interesting though, is in the archeological record, I, I've seen this commented on before coins and armies go together. Like right. that's really the important point. So, and and by armies we also mean professional armies, not just uh, little bands of people that you know are, are made to fight for honor tokens, aka the armies that are described, the armies that are described in like uh, Homer, um, which are, you know. They're not, yeah, they're fighting for honor tokens and, and slaves and stuff. They're not, um, and they're more or less conscript nobles. So, um, yeah, they, uh, they, there's this anthropologist that Graeber cites, um, whose name I forget, alas, but, uh, the, he coined the term the military coinage complex, uh, which Graeber expanded into the military coinage slavery complex. Um, you know, you, people start using money. Be, uh, because of the spread of these armies and the way that the imp the uh, the obligations that were imposed upon the population could only be paid back with the coins, or at least this is the chartalist story um, the of tax receivability, because they basically say all money is tax driven money. So this is the first circulating money that is money as we would understand it. Uh, accounting systems existed previously, but this is the, the, the and, and, you know, the silver uh, international thing that the Tartalists ignore, but this is the first kind of like money that's used for retail payments, right? Because retail markets come into existence with this money. Me buying goods and services, 
happens because this money exists and it's an axial age rather than er earlier invention. So, so to recap for our listeners uh, in a very simplistic, which is probably wrong fashion, we have replication gift economies, accounting, silver, silver tokens between elites as in a way to deal with exchanges between different accounting systems, armies, and slaves. <laughs> Uh, what, what slaves predate this by a lot, so I should probably be careful with that. But 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 the, the standardizing this, and then we get metal coinage money as we think of it now, about two thousand five hundred years ago. Am I summarizing you correctly? More or less. Yeah. Okay. And I don't want to linger too much on this. This is all still within MMT world, except for the international silver stuff, which I explained because. It's going to be important later, but, but everything else is kind of their story. So this is the historical analysis that they use. But the problem is it stops with Alexander the Great, like between the origin, like basically between like a, a very shady story that they tell about the origins of coins all the way through to the paper money that's used in colonial America in like the 1600s. They have this gap in their story. And that's the first problem. Why don't yeah. they talk about anything that happens in between? And then I was wondering about Rome because, like, the devaluation of metal in the basement of metal was actually crucial to the Roman economy. And I've never heard a, a, a neo chartalist explain why there. I get, you know, I guess the, the it's just denial that that's that that's what was a significant factor. So yeah, that's fascinating. So what 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 do they jump to from this? Like, where do we go after we got we got the we get Greece. We get Lydia, we get Alexander the Great in the Hellenistic period. Stop. Where do we go now? Well, usually in MMT here we go to the colonial paper money, but yeah, I think a pretty that, big jump. But I think <laughs> that we want to get closer. So I don't know, Steve. Where should we pick up our version of the story? Do you think? Uh, if you want to get, if you want to get closer than U.S. colonial paper money, all the way from. <laughs> <laughs> Hellenistic times. Uh, um, I guess we could go to. They sometimes will go a bit earlier than that to some debates in the ninth, not the nineteenth century. The let's see, actually no, that might be the earliest one. Now that I think of it, we're talking about the, the colonial the... paper money in the U.S. I know some people talk about the invention of the idea of capitalism about currency sovereignty and like Aquinas, but the those readings are very strange to me and seem tortured. So it has its like I would say in general they jump to colonialism. Mm -hmm. Like the colonial era in Africa, the US, elsewhere. Yeah. And a where you have like an a colonial power is imposing tax duties upon the colonists and also upon anyone else who lives there who's working slaves there who's trading slaves to those places um and the colonial the colonial authorities who are local to the colony will like not not any of the merchants or like the agents of the elites are going between there but the local authorities will sometimes impose paper money of their own. And we have records of them both creating and destroying these currencies in the U.S. colonies and elsewhere in African colonies owned by European powers. Yeah, and uh, Steve, in fact, do you want to, especially since you wrote that section of the book, the uh, talk a little more about Matthew Forstetter's work on the African case because i think that that that's like the mm tiers love bringing that out as like we have this is our theory of colonialism and why we don't ignore it and why tax receipts yeah, yeah yeah so um for for setters uh one of the prominent mm tiers these days and he um is an anarchist mm tier actually yeah book tonight so, yeah he's a book tonight yeah um so he wrote a history of African colonial monetary policy, and we cite it in our in our upcoming book. And they they found old colonial records not only of the type of um, 
fiat money creation destruction type stuff but detailed records of the imposition of the taxes upon the residents of the colony the local residents and saying like explicit making it explicit that they're driving the receivability of their currency by not just imposing but also brutally enforcing uh these tax liabilities if they were not paid and it's only receivable in the money the local money not like british pounds or something so so why do you skip the medieval period? Why is the medieval period skipped? Because I know there's I know there's metalist transactions during the medieval period because we have evidence of coins like all over the place. Um, and while there are certain times where taxes were taken in kind in, in, in uh, manorial societies, most of the time they weren't actually. So why why do why do the neo chartalists jump all the way to early modern colonialism? And I, I you know I'll get on my other thing about their love of slave economies and forced people into proletarian relations and this, that, and the other. But, but um, uh, I shouldn't say their love, but they sure, they sure do present it as if it was a good thing. Um, so, so why, wh why do they skip that? <laughs> it seems pretty important. <laughs> well, this, this is where it's really interesting because, you know, the way that I got into MMT was actually through the Graber stuff more than like the U.S. government has the right to issue as many dollars as it wants stuff. I had heard about that stuff before, didn't really understand it. The Graber stuff was what really convinced me because I was like, wow, like this is like a really different history of this institution than the one that I had been taught. It makes a lot more sense. It's rooted in anthropology. It must be true. But then there were two problems. One is this gap. And then the other problem is that the actual anthropological sources, even Graeber, have these anomalies that they that don't fit the MMT story. I would argue, and I think Steve would too, because we wrote this, that part of the reason why MMT does this time skip is because that whole epoch between basically like the totally fiat and non-circulating Mesopotamian accounting systems, between that and like the modern paper money systems that developed, you know, in European colonies and then later with like the, you know, the, the paper bills tied to, tied to, uh, gold to international gold. And then eventually just like, uh, like no convertibility requirement, pure paper money. Like they can do the modern period. Okay. They can do the bronze age really well, but in the middle, there's all this stuff that doesn't fit. And it's just like a bunch of anomalies that don't fit the story of money is nothing but the accounting system and an arbitrary issuance that can be made of anything. Um, and it was those anomalies that got us started on this path. Um, and we can actually talk about some of those. Um, yeah, what's the first anomaly that you that you noticed? I told you of some beginning of my slightly unfair characterization of the debate. Uh, some of the things I noticed, but what was the first anomaly you noticed? Well, um, the one of the main things is why was the token always made of gold or silver? And, not, and it's actually, it turns out that that's not actually quite the case, but you know, you have basically these coins that are made of metal all over Eurasia. Why were they made of these rare metals? Why weren't they made of something that was less of a pain in the butt and more common, like copper, for example? Why? I mean, they had papyrus. Why didn't they make paper money? Um, the the you know the uh, then there was like the, uh, the this gold standard, as it were. I mean, that was de facto because all the coin all, all the coins were made of uh, gold and silver lasted for like fifteen hundred years. If gold standards are inefficient because it arbitrarily limits how much money you can put in the economy. Why did they cling to it for so long? That was one major, major kind of contradiction. Like, 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 is it just because they were stupid or is it, or, or, or more generously, had they not made the scientific discovery that MMT did that, that really enhanced their ability to, uh, uh, to, uh, do economic planning because they realized the true nature of money and so on. Um, so that was, uh, that was one empirical anomaly. Uh, Steve, what are some other ones that we, that we had? 
well, we went over like the period of the story of um, the Mughal emperor Tughlaq. Ah, that's right. So what happened yeah. to Tughlaq? And he was trying to he tried uh, in vain to convert uh, was it copper coins? Tried to convert to copper coins from gold, and the regime fell pretty swiftly, partly in part due to that, in large part due to that. Yes. Uh, so you had you had like um, agents of his state doing business with other states or other like beneficiaries, like uh, other like powerful merchants who suddenly are like horribly devalued, like with their holdings are horribly devalued because of this. Yes. And, uh, and what's really screwed up about the two block example is that he was inspired by the example of China. He wanted to switch from gold coins to copper coins because he saw that China in that period, which was the Mughal Empire, I believe it was the Song Dynasty, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it was correctly. the Song Dynasty. I, I brought it up in a debate with uh, with uh, Max Siho, but I had actually mischaracterized it a little bit. So. Well, they were, using, they were using paper money. Yep. In and and so Tuglock saw that and he's like, Oh, money can be made of anything, it's just based on the authority of the state. Therefore, I can switch to copper coins. MMT says you can do that, but then he failed, it overthrew his regime, and they went right back to gold coins. So, why did it work for Song China and not for Tuglock? And here's what's even more screwed up it's not a technological advancement thing because in a later period, the, 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 the Chinese dynasty could not maintain paper money. And they went back to um, a currency made of a precious metal. I forget which one, but it was it was a precious metal. So it's not like a develop. It's not like a tech like the the capa- the technological capacity changed radically because you even have these periods of moving back and forth, which is another contradiction. Graeber has this crazy quote: uh, "The book that is supposed to be, along with Hudson, which is its main source, the historical story that validates MMT." He has a quote that says. As a result, this is quoting Graeber, while credit systems, credit money systems, tend to dominate in periods of relative social peace or across networks of trust, in periods characterized by widespread war and plunder, these systems, these monetary systems, tend to be replaced by precious metal. Yeah, I noticed that quote actually 10, 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago when that book was, was all the rage. I actually got into a fight with David Grader on Twitter about it when he was still alive. Um, because I said, well, I actually said to him, it seems to me like in this quote, the roots of something like historical materialism and clear periodizations and limits may actually be there. And of course, if anyone's ever read Graeber's work, he doesn't like when you start saying there might be material limits to things. So, um, yeah. And, um, it gets even worse because, okay. In neo-tartalism, money is a creature of the state. There's a parenthetical that I skipped over in that Graeber quote. Whether, like, so credit systems dominate in some eras, whether they're created by states or in most periods, transnational institutions like merchant guilds or communities of faith. So, like, this is another problem. You're not supposed to have non-state money in MMT because... The state and its imposed tax obligation is supposed to be the thing that drives the use of money in the first place due to the story about the innkeeper. Yeah, but but this has always confused me because they they read modern states into – well, now it makes sense, though. That's why you would skip the medieval period because you have have multiple centers of of compulsion um, going on. Um, You know, you have semi-taxes like tithes and – this and the other, you have serfdom, you have a whole bunch of stuff that involves multiple, no, there's no singular authority that could even impose a tax. I mean, I think about like debates between bishops and kings about who had the right to mint money in a region, like in Mercia, this was a big deal in the ninth century, I think. Um, so maybe that's even later, maybe it's even earlier than that, maybe it's the eighth century. Um, so it's, it, it's crazy to me as a person who studied, you know, a whole lot of uh, of anthropology and looked at a whole lot of history on medieval England and France, that you don't deal with this anywhere in a lot of, like, it it, it just blows my mind. And Graeber kind of deals with it, but it, if anyone's ever read a Graeber book, they're kind of polemics that are that are are assembled by neat facts and anecdotes. 
um, many of which are actually quite insightful, but they're often assembled in a way that you can't make a coherent narrative out of out of anything. I think kind of a purpose. Um, and they are also crypto polemics. Side note, if you don't know, Graeber's offering are often arguing with other ma- anarchist anthropologists and Marxist anthropologists, and that is affecting his selection of anecdote. And when people look at this stuff, they don't know that. Um, so it's it, it's been somewhat illuminating to see someone try to work through these these problems. Because I've also th- there are MMTers who have admitted that even in like Kanap. Um, there were people who, you know, like in the, the token theory of money, like the token is, can exist in informal, but coercive systems that are not states, but the focus becomes on taxation later on. So it doesn't really like, unless you think other groups have authorities to tax and non-state actors have authorities to tax, in which case that starts to break down what the word tax means, um, it, this gets really murky really fast. Yeah, and I would add just one more example before we move on that really bothered me, which is um, the you look at this medieval and also even the early modern period, and you see this thing called a bill of exchange show up. Mm-hmm. And um, so, so Graeber's right. Sometimes you have like international communities of faith that have credit systems that they build with each other. There's actually one that lasted to this day in the Islamic world. Um, and I forget the name of it. I'm so sorry. I will find it. I will Google it when I'm done talking and then provide the name at some point. But th- there's a credit system that still exists to this day where basically you go to one guy in one country and you say, I need to ship a certain amount of money to this other country. And the person says, okay, uh, uh, just, uh, just pay it to me. Uh, so you give him a hundred dollars and then he calls up his friend who's in the other country and says, I need to make a transfer of a hundred dollars. There's no actual transfer. It's purely credit. So the other guy, uh, hands over a hundred of his dollars to some person on the other end. Um, this is the Templar banking system and the hospitality banking system. Exactly. It's it's the same structure. It's a purely accounting based, and the reason why they do it is because they add a little interest charge or a service charge for the uh, for the payment that they collect themselves. But these merchants in different countries, there's no there's no money being transferred between them. One is getting some money from a customer. The other one is giving money to a customer on the other end. But like in the expectation that in the future, somebody's going to come in. And if I take their money, the person on the other end is going to disperse the money on the other end. So it's a trust based credit network that only exists. The transfer only exists in the accounting books. Um, so the, the, the it, this, the origins of this, the Templars had a version of this, this uh, the societies across the world had versions of this. If wherever there were these like long distance trade networks, um, non that's, this is, there's versions of this that you can actually like do um, very complex payment systems, and it looks a lot like money. Um, then it, you get even more money-like instruments when you have a merchant who, let's say that you're a bank. And in the olden days, banks weren't even really banks. A lot of the times they were merchant families that also had credit services as part of like the things that they did. Um, the merchant might write on a little piece of paper with their letterhead, this is worth 100 gold coins. And we'll give it to somebody. And they'll say, that's my bill of exchange. If you send it to my cousin who's in this other city, they will accept it at the equivalent of $100 uh, or 100, let's say, gold coins. Um, the, that bill of exchange could, like, it, wouldn't, it, could, it could be just like the person takes it to the other place and hands it over. But that was also an instrument that you could use for payments. Uh, why could you use it for payments? So let's say that like I'm one merchant, Steve's another merchant. Varn is the person that I give my bill of exchange to. Varn can actually use in a lot of contexts, in a lot of historical t- places and times, that bill of exchange to pay his hotel tab. And then the hotel owner has the bill of exchange. And the bill and the and the and the hotel owner can use that to pay some, I don't know, some contractor. And then the contractor has it. And then eventually the contractor goes to Steve. And Steve doesn't care where the bill of exchange came from. It's a bill of exchange that has our bank's letterhead. So he receives it in payment worth 100 coins. That is a means of payment. And not only for us within the the, the bank family, but 
for all these other intermediary services. Why does the hotel guy want that bill of exchange? Why does there's no tax obligation that the bank has imposed upon the hotel or upon the contractor? So why are they accepting it as a means of payment? In other words, it has receivability, but it doesn't have tax receivability. The receivability is coming from somewhere else. Why is that? But what, what, what is that? It's not the state. So what the hell? But it, it looks a lot like money. And in fact, paper money actually evolved out of bills of exchange. So this is actually really important because fiat money, which is supposed to be the thing that MMT explains on a fundamental level, evolved out of a system that is anomalous to the MMT story of money as a creature of the state. So how, how do we account for this? It seems like you could tell a story where, for example, the hotel owes the bank. So the hotel, if they owe the bank money for whatever reason, let's say this bank loaned them to build the hotel, they can repay their mortgage or their loan or whatever using the bill of exchange, and that's why they want it. So this means that it's kind of like tax receivability. It's an imposed obligation, but it's a non-state actor doing it. Um, this is still anomalous because it's like, I thought only the state could do it. So that means that other imposed obligations matter too. That's interesting. But then there's another really uh, interesting possibility. What if it's just because this merchant family has, as merchant families do, lots of juicy, delicious goods and services? Lots of things that people want because they have the spices that come from the distant country. If they accept the bill of exchange as a means of payment, that means that you can pay them in that thing rather than use your gold or silver. That means that if you want those juicy, delicious spices, you can pay for them using the bill of exchange. So in that case, receivability, if this hypothesis is correct, could be driven by a totally non-coercive mechanism. Like it, it's you use you want to use an instrument as money because you can use it to pay for things that you want from somebody who's the only person who has them. That is a potentially important mechanism. Um, so we see things like this in this anomaly period of the 1500 years that MMT doesn't like to describe and MMT doesn't like to describe them because it breaks the rules. It's not allowed. Right. I mean, it do also doesn't help that like what we think of as states kind of barely exist in the form of kingdoms and private public. I mean, there's all kinds of problems and which like I could see where the antique world is actually more useful for the story than the medieval. Um, it is interesting to me uh, how many people have focused on the end of the medieval period in debates, but in religious debates between Franciscans and Augustinians and whatnot as the origins of modern capitalism um, and metallism, which also didn't make a whole lot of sense to me because, uh, well, there are metal coins way before that. Um, but nonetheless. Um, so, okay. What are the implications here about, like, let, let's, uh, let's talk... Let's talk about the constitutional order stuff that comes up in um, uh, Christine Dawson's work um, a little bit. Uh, and maybe can you guys go over that for my listeners? Because that's a more obscure part of the MMT that a lot of people do not know. And even some popular MMTers have misrepresented. So... If I could make a request, could we actually get to that after we've explained the coins? Because I feel sure. like... Go ahead. Go back to corns. Because I think that, like, okay, so we did the anomalies, um, and uh, I'm trying to think of how we can transition to the inside-outside money stuff. Um, Steve, you got any ideas? Um, I mean, to me, bills of exchange are actually a pretty good way. <laughs> okay, yeah, then you take uh, over. I'm a little stumped for how to get to the uh, to the next step here. Um, let's see. So we have these, we have these anomalies, and many of them have to do with international trade. Mm -hmm. And so we're embedded. We have these domestic monetary systems, which are like, okay, yes, you do see, you do see plenty of these um, more gift exchangey um, type things. Like uh, we didn't mention it before, but tally sticks are like a like a credit instrument that was used domestically, and uh, it's one the MMTers bring up a lot. And like, okay, our tally sticks, um, do they get you liquidity 100 miles from where you are? Probably not. Do they give you, um, this is the English credit 
instrument that was traded for a while. Not traded, but used to settle to uh, sell debts. Um, we have these domestic systems. They're kind of intermeshed within an international monetary order that um, the specifics change. But there seems to be this kind of like, uh, you have, like the mmt -er would say, Look at all. Look at how all of these. Well, in their mind, all of these systems, including the one in the fifteen hundred year gap, uh, show, like, evolve on their own to say to say, oh, tax receivability is the name of the game in terms of why people grow to use a certain type of money for, for their to meet their needs. Um, but actually, there's like this international. There's an international order of merchants and other elites. And just regular people who are using money outside of the domestic sphere that someone in someone whose trade is only in the domestic sphere may occasionally like in the Mesopotamian times you would see silver and you would certainly know about it and its use in trade, but you would be extinguishing your debts in shekels or shekels of something else not like silver shekels but some other type of shekel and later in like um in the time of coinage um when coins became more widely used sure you have you use you start to use coins to extinct to as a means of payment for spot payments and not just saying like um instead of like a credit system of um of not of uh basically saying you owe someone and you run up a tab or something and you, now you can do spot payments in the in a retail way and not like a wholesale way okay so we're getting a lot more circulation um eventually in our writing um we wanted to get like a sense of okay there's like outside money and inside money yes and outside i'm already i'm saying the terms before i've defined them uh but Perry Merling um, wrote in his book, uh, I think it was The Natural Hierarchy of Money. Merling begins by like invoking a distinction between inside money and outside money. And for him, a country's own currency and all of its financial assets denominated in that currency are inside money, whereas everything else is outside money. And most money is outside to you. So domestic issuers are going to be needing some outside money to settle, mm. to get what they need, to import what they need, unless their inside money is very highly coveted for other reasons. Because like foreign, foreign users of their currency, um, do they have, are they, do they want to go and get the foreign currency, the Forex, because of tax receivability? It seems unlikely. They certainly, they may occasionally need to like pay sales tax in the US, like if they're an e-commerce business or something um, here and there, like if they have sales in the US, uh, but is, that, is tax receivability really the full story to this? It doesn't seem like it based on our earlier historic studies. Yeah, that's that's a great explanation. To expand on the point of Merling's basic argument, so I always like to start with the gossip. So I'll start with the gossip first. Perry Merling is, I would argue, a heterodox economist, uh, including one who's deeply influenced by similar sources as MMT. He's very influenced by Minsky, for example, but he is not an mmt -er. And I would argue the mmt -ers often display a certain kind of contempt for his theories whenever they're brought up. Um, however, he actually begins the process of, you know, from my point of view, somebody who was kind of raised within MMT in a certain sense, 
of weaning us off of some of their language. And this is why it's like really important to kind of first understand the basic MMT story, which is like true enough to describe certain things, um, but then also kind of start realizing its blind spots and therefore the need for this kind of paradigm shift, analogous to the paradigm shift between Newtonian physics and quantum physics, right? Like Newtonian physics work really well for describing things, you know, on the level of like visible phenomena, but you know, in certain domains and in and at a certain scale, like the, their predictions started breaking down and not being able to predict the world. And for, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert on the history of physics, but basically it was through realizing those kinds of gaps that people invented quantum physics. Um, so it's a similar kind of thing. MMT describes things really well up to a certain point. The blind spots force us to go elsewhere. One of the places that we want is Merlin. Why? Because he basically creates this story of what he calls the hierarchy of money, but state money is not at the top of it. Gold is at the top of it, which sounds like it's a gold nut theory, and therefore we should dismiss it because the notion that the best money is gold because of a barter story about the origins of money, we've seen that that's false. However, the reason what he calls gold is not really literally gold anymore. Uh, it was It was... At the in the nineteenth century, gold was at the top of the hierarchy of money. But the whole point that Merling really wants to make in this essay is that the top of the hierarchy of money is whatever you can use to make international payments, because that thing is going to be the most scarce possible thing to any conceivable agent. Because you see, Merling's pyramid is actually subjective. It's not just objective, like where you are in the pyramid kind of depends, or sorry, what you think of as money or as being more money-like is for him actually kind of like based on your position. Uh, so for example, to you and me, money in the sense of dollar, like, you know, uh, the, well, let's actually to simplify it. Uh, let's say we're Mexican. You know, if we were all Mexican, uh, pesos would seem really money-like to us, right? Because we don't issue pesos. We're currency users rather than currency issuers for pesos, which means that we have to work to get pesos. Or if we have a business, the pesos come out of our profits, you know? So we need to get pesos in some way in order to be able to, to have them. Uh, they, are, um, they are scarce to us. Uh, but to the bank, the Mexican bank that issues pesos, um, they're, they poof, pesos into existence with loans, or at least the banknote version of pesos. This is kind of getting into endogenous money theory, which is a little too complicated to get into in depth, but you know, they, they're fine with banknotes, but the dot, the, the actual pesos that the banknotes convert into one-to-one, -one, um, those are scarce to the banks, but not to the government, which issues those, right? So the government poofs those pesos into existence. So from their point of view, it's not scarce to them at all. This is basically the MMT story. They, issue as many of them as they need to accomplish their goals. It circulates and then they receive them back in taxes. But guess what is scarce to the Mexican government? Dollars. Because they don't issue dollars, do they? They issue pesos. They're never going to run out of pesos because they're the origins of all pesos. But what about the, the, the dollar? Yeah, we well, don't buy gold between states. We don't buy oil between states and pesos. So. Or anything. It's not so. The, the problem with the uh, with the uh, the petrodollars story, which says that the power of the almighty dollar internationally comes from it from oil being priced in it, is that you could just as easily talk about uh, lithium dollars or about you know capital ca capital goods dollars, you know machinery dollars, uh, computer dollars, you know uh, 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 you know technical expert dollars, right? Drone, they, drone dollars. Drone dollars, you know, like uh, rifle dollars. Yeah, it's not uh, just oil. Weapon, weapons transfer dollars. Right. Yeah, it's it's not just that, that uh, oil is priced in dollars. It's that the dollar is a general, in fact, the general international means of payment. Um, now, Mexico does not issue dollars. So is that a big deal? Well, who needs dollars, right? Why do you, why do you need dollars? Because you need all that stuff. Because Mexico doesn't make all of it. You know, they make some oil, but, but they don't make, I mean, I forget what Mexico imports, but they import a lot, you know, there's, and, and most countries have to import a lot. And any biophysical resource that a country needs in order to accomplish its goals, or for that matter, agents within countries like companies, for example, um, but does not issue 
itself the means of payment for those goods, though they need to use somebody else's money to pay for those goods. So this is where Merling's distinction between inside and outside money comes from. Any currency that you issue yourself is inside money to you, but any currency that you need to make a payment that is, uh, that is not your own, that is outside money to you. And outside money is always by definition scarce. You don't issue it yourself, so therefore you need to find some kind of means of collecting it. And this is why he puts it at the top of his hierarchy of money. And I would also add that while we were researching this, reading like the upshot for me, at least, maybe it's similar for, for John. Um, the upshot for me reading this as like a somewhat, but increasingly loosely charlist person reading this was like, okay, so it, sound, it sounds like he's saying outside money is a biophysical resource to, to the, from the perspective of the person for whom it is outside, it is a biophysical resource. If you were to slot it into um, the, the chartalist system as we understand it through MMT. Yes. You need, it's um, like, why would it not be? This is purchasing power that was issued by someone else. Yeah. And it's for, <laughs> right. Uh, which explains why everyone's like, I remember so it's money. It's money that sure. Yeah. You can create as much of your own money, but there are other types of money in the world that you need to get imports and stuff. And you cannot create by your own, by your own, Logic. <laughs> your right. logic you so, can't. so there's two implications with this almost instantly, though. Like, bigger states will have much more money that's inside because they can command more production within their state. So that's already in MMT. But it does immediately explain the issue of things like Venezuela, Egypt, etc. When everyone's like, oh, they just peg their money to the dollar. And I'm like, I wonder why they did that because they yes. need to buy stuff. Yes. <laughs> and it's um, exchange rates are so interesting, but I don't think we're going to have time to do them. But what you just said, they peg their, their currency to the dollar in order to get more dollars. That insight is so profound that it's actually like the beginning of deep, deep wisdom about almost everything that happens on international markets and exchange rates and all these other things that seem so abstract and so complicated and only technocrats can understand them. It's actually not that hard to understand once you understand that you can only buy stuff in your economy with your money. The instant that you need something from outside, you need somebody else's money. An easy way to get somebody else's money is to promise that yours is convertible to it for reasons that are very complicated to get into and we don't, won't get into it, but that explains why people like pegs and why pegs are not unlike MMT's arguments, irrational. In fact, no less an authority for the MMTers than John Maynard Keynes liked pegs so much that in his Bancor proposal, he basically wanted to abolish international foreign exchange markets and replace them with a peg to a world unit of account called Bancor. Well, it, it's interesting because a lot of the MMT attempts to get out of their problems in regards to small states rely, rely on stuff like cryptocurrency our dual currency system for a small state where they trade on the international markets with this cryptocurrency which you know acts mysteriously a lot like gold um or or whatever to get them out of you know the currency buying that they're in with the reserve currency but to me this grants your point even because they're looking for a way to get the outside money or some other counter outside money to it. Now, I, when we talk about outside money, there's more than one, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the yuan is an outside money that is quite useful. I mean, 32% of the world's trade is in yuan. Um, it, it actually could be more if they wanted it to be, uh, they being the Chinese government. Uh, but regardless, th this encompasses multiple systems and... We have multiple symptoms in the past too, because metal coinage was was denoted in multiple metals, um, in, in international trade during like let's say the early modern or late medieval period. So, yeah, I think that might be helpful for people actually. If um, if we talked about the reserve currency system, um, the Steve, you want to tackle that because I know this is a sure. uh, well, like like today, I think the U.S. is what accounts for the US dollar accounts for like 60% mm -hmm. I want to say of currency used in trade 
Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think it's around sixty. I, someone uh, in uh, someone in the comments can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but it's like far and away, far and away, higher than the next most ones. Still, with the the euro, the yen, the um, the British pound sterling. Um, they just, uh, however, the U.S. is uh, it's been on a downward trajectory for a while, and like there's. I forget where it was, but I saw someone who tried to project when the U.S. would no longer be a major reserve currency in in the eyes of, like, monetary economists who keep track of these things. Because, like, you can project based on its its pace with which the reserve status decreases. And when we say reserve, what we really mean is other countries must keep that currency in reserve in their central banks in order to conduct the trade they need to import things to settle financial obligations if they have debt denominated in that particular currency. Um, mm -hmm. Like China has a ton of dollars. They do uh, because of trade with us and um, they're rational. They, they, uh, they want it not only because we're their trade partner, but because it's a major, because it's a major reserve currency for the world. It makes it easier to trade with everyone currently. Um, maybe that wouldn't always be the case, but it is now. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of like the order is structured upon um, U.S. imperialism almost, because it's like, uh, why yeah. would why would um, we have some work in order to show that fully, of course? But like, why why does the U.S. continue to have a sixty percent chunk of circulating currencies in the world? Is it because of oil? No, that seems reductive. Is it because of the military alone? That also seems reductive. But it's because of power. And there's different types of power that can be projected in the world, like by cultural or, uh, yes, reliance upon oil still, the petro state, sure. But that's not the full story. And for, for the US, do they have outside money? Is there outside money for the US perspective? Not nearly as much as for other countries, anyway. The door is almost shut to some countries. Like if you're Tunisia, if you're Tunisia, then most money is outside money to you. If you're the U.S., then it's all inside almost, because everyone is using your money. So it's almost in a way like you're, you're um, when the U.S. prints its own money, it could be effectively producing forex, and yes. hence. It's where like the U.S. is so close to to it's so far on one end of the spectrum of receivability, if you will, that it effectively does print forex, and almost nothing is outside money for the U.S. And it's like a result of their imperial power, right? Yes, and, and this is so like and, and that's the... the same MMT. So yes, MMT does apply to U.S. And it applies to other places, but some places, if you went to, if you went to Tunisia, as economist, um, MMT economist uh, Fidel um, Fidel Kaboub has done, I think you think he's advised them. Um, I'm I don't know what they talked about in there, but I'm pretty sure that he told them to float their currency, and they they didn't then, and they don't now. So they, they floated they, the currency in Egypt and it was a mess. So they right. Have... So it's like, and and in fact, most of the world does fix their currency either to one currency or to a basket of currencies or to a combination of currencies and commodity prices or something. Right. Yes, even many floats. If you actually kind of look at the fine print, there are a lot of countries that float their currencies, but in fact, they kind of set targets in like their the three to five currencies that are the most important currencies for their trade partners uh and then they like are like we want to make sure that the exchange rate of our currencies remains roughly within this range for these kinds of currencies so israel does this for example israel you look on wikipedia it's a float but uh, but it's a managed float and then you look at how they manage it and it's which is basically like having four pegs so and for loose pegs, but nevertheless for pegs. But they say it's a float because for all the other currencies, it's, you know, free for all. And they still 
like have a wide enough range that forex markets can affect the price of the currency somewhat, but they make sure, but they still basically have semi pegs. So and that's the other thing here too, is that like, you know, a float versus a peg, that's not really a binary policy choice. That's like a spectrum. Yeah. Um, whereas MMT dogmatically insists that you have to have um, a, a floating currency system because otherwise you're creating this cur- this convertibility obligation uh, that, that limits your ability to issue your own currency. There are MMTers who will. Uh, I just had a, a fellow called One Dime who got in an argument with me when I pointed out that um, China didn't have currency sovereignty, and he was like, "Well, of course they do. They peg their currency." And I'm like, "Well, they choose to. They have two different currency systems: one internal, one external. Um, like a lot of socialist states have done. Cuba used to as well, as you've written on yourself, uh, John Michael. Um, but um, th- that." Hell, in the Soviet Union, there was three currency systems um, that uh, that this means that currency sovereignty, as defined by prop, by all MMTers, but maybe Bill Mitchell, uh, however, only applies to the Anglosphere and Japan. And I've been trying to like and people like, well, Japan, Japan proves it's not just imperialism. I'm like. Japan has a special re- Japan and actually the entire the entire EU if we're honest has a special relationship with the United States because of the terms of rebuilding after World War II which people outside of our sphere do not have. And so, yes, Japan has currency sovereignty conditions as long as its primary trading partners are trading in dollars. Well, um, here's what I would say Varn. I and this is getting into subjects that I think we don't want to go too deep into because a they would take us off track to finishing explaining the theory and b there also are a lot of unknowns here we're actually kind of at the cutting edge of knowledge uh as we ask those questions but i would say that and i say this as someone who thinks that imperialism does have a huge role to play uh that in my in my working theory of why this is true but i think that methodologically we actually should hesitate before we insist like dogmatically or stipulate that imperialism must be the reason that a currency becomes a reserve currency. And I say this as someone who, again, in my explanation actually plays a big role, but it's the reason why I think we should hesitate is because the question of how a country becomes a reserve currency is actually a highly, I mean, we don't know. Like, right, right. like people don't actually like we have the history of how the dollar did it sort of except that there's actually two or three different separate stories for how it did it and nobody quite knows what how it's true we also don't know exactly i mean international uh like the international means of payment being a a fiat issuance rather than a commodity is actually extremely rare it's a very modern phenomenon of the last hundred years for the most part not exclusively as i said with the bills of exchange but but like you know the, but even bills of exchange were never like the international means of payment for everyone right this is very new so we don't actually know fully scientifically um the general universal rules for how a country becomes a reserve currency. What I think is most important for the purposes of discussion is to understand that however a country becomes a reserve currency, the key thing about being a reserve currency and uh, really being a reserve currency means because of these percentages that I've put on my screen share, like that you are the dollar, the Euro, the pound, the yen, or the renminbi in that order, right? Like, um the the it's it's not any currency that anyone holds in reserve it's one of those five because those are the five that are a significant percentage of global payments um the 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 and and the the thing is that like the, the what that means is that like people want to hoard these currencies because they can use them for international transactions. If somebody needs to pay for imports, they can use, I mean, usually they're going to use the dollar, but if they don't have dollars, they can use euros or if they don't have euros with some countries, but it's getting the number of countries you can buy from is getting smaller. As I move down this list for some countries, you can use pounds, usually it meaning Britain and its trade partners that want pounds. Right. Um, and other countries you can use yen, right? So like if you're somebody who needs to import from Japan, 
you want to collect not just dollars, but yen, because you can use the yen to pay the Japanese for imports from them without paying using your dollars. And you need to hoard your dollars because their dollars are the things that you can use to buy from anyone in the world. So this is the key thing to internalize is that a reserve currency is one of the top currencies that is used for many payments across many countries. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, there's only really five of them. That's, that's the key thing is that there, there, there's not that many. And to be, I mean, we know that the countries that are in that category are rich, that they're industrially powerful, that they have, that they are imperialists or were in the past, uh, in the case of Japan, right? Uh, the, the, and, and you know, all, all but two of them are integrated into the same imperial system too, honestly. And that is true too, interestingly. Um, so that's, so that raises these interesting questions about like, you know, what is it that drives a reserve currency? I think imperialism has a lot to do with it. I think um, industrial strength has a lot to do with it, but we can remain agnostic about what the causes are. because That's a, ve a, a very complex run of current research. But I think that the most important thing is that like, these are the outside monies that you use to buy imports. And if you don't right. have them, you can't get imports. And if you can't get imports, then anything in your society that depends upon imports, you can't get. doesn't matter how many pesos you print. It's not going to get you that lithium. You know, let me, and let me, Yeah, let's put this into some big current things. The reason why taking, uh, uh, say, Russia off the shrift is devastating is you will note that the ruble is not a major reserve currency anywhere in the world. Um, because, but for a variety of reasons, despite, and this is an interesting thing on imperialism here because, because, uh, Russia has the, the, the military capacity of at least the third largest or the third most developed military in the world, maybe third or fourth. Um, but, um, it does not have the productive or currency holding capacity in the same way, nor the sphere of influence. Um, whereas China has the second largest military in the world, but also it's the number one producer. Um, and if, if it, show, if it was to say, shut off all things from the United States and Europe, or if, or if the United States and Europe were to do it to China, actually too, the entire economic system would collapse. Like that's almost inevitable, at least under current conditions. So it's, it, I, I think people need to understand this because this explains international politics in a way that no MMT or has been able to do for me at all ever. So, you know, um, and I'm not saying I, I actually think your, your point about imperialism cannot be the sole factor. There could be multiple determining factors here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think it has to be. I mean, people think that the United States doesn't produce stuff. It actually is the third largest industrial producer in the world. So it does produce stuff. It just doesn't employ people to do it, um, which is another thing. But I, I would hear stuff like Warren Mosler, and we will get into this uh, more in a completely different interview, um, but would say stuff like, well, the U.S. inflation is based off of purchasing capacity of the government. Um, and what and what they indirectly accept as payments and don't bargain down. And and I'd be like, the dollars on international markets, even the U.S. government, even though it has power of what it can print, cannot set all the prices. There's no way. Yeah. Whatever it is that, yeah, we, we should leave it an open scientific question on what really does determine who gets to be a reserve currency, how do they stay that way. It seems to be, whatever it is, it's extremely overdetermined. There's probably many different sufficient conditions that go into it, and we just have to keep, we have to keep thinking about it in podcasts like this one. Yeah. So I think that the next step here is we, we've talked about the current system that's used for international payments in some detail. But I think that in order to really understand um, the flaws with MMT, we actually have to go back in time again to where we left off. Because with your understanding that you now have of inside versus outside money, um, or what we call money versus Forex. So what, we're, what we, in our private language that we've developed, um, money is just the 
you know, the issuance of somebody. Yeah, uh, and it's usually the state. Forex is whatever is scarce to them, which can be somebody else's issuances. As we see, it can also be a commodity that's used as an international means of payment. It's whatever you use to get imports is Forex uh, in our theory. And we take the word from international foreign exchange markets, which are the markets in which cur international currencies are traded against each other. Um, the um, the But it's, our, it's, it's a synonym for what... Um, Merling calls outside money. It's it's uh, that we're just using a different word because we thought it independently, and then we read Merling, and it's like, oh, cool. Um, the uh, so forex has a long history, and in fact, if you trace its history, that it, the concept of outside money or forex actually explains many of the anomalies that we pointed out um, about MMT. So let's rewind the clock back to that point where we left off where you know first the lydian king and then eventually great conquerors like alexander the great the roman empire the mauryan empire etc etc uh han china all start issuing coins that circulate and are received back in taxes and in the interim they create retail markets because people want them uh in order to be able to pay the tax at least that's the chartalist story but there is a huge problem with that story, namely the stuff that we pointed out about how the coins are always made of these rare metals. And in fact, when the state doesn't have enough metals, it doesn't issue enough coins. So there's huge periods in monetary history where um, coins are like, you know, like there isn't enough money in the economy because money is a kind of in a Keynesian framework, money is a kind of lubricant in a monetary production economy. Production can't happen unless there's money with which to pay for it. Uh, so the amount of money in the economy as a whole, uh, if it's too little, there won't be enough stuff being produced and there won't be, there'll be unemployment there, 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 there will be shortages of goods and services. And like economies uh, before the rise of fiat money often had money shortage problems because there wasn't enough gold and silver. Why would you limit yourself this way? Why not make it out of copper or papyrus or anything? Right. Especially since, as we saw, um, you know, in the Bronze Age, like money didn't even circulate at all. And they had, um, you know, uh, large scale economic activities that were within the accounting system. So why make it out of gold and silver? Um, the, the answer is because of a nuance in the anthropological literature, precisely the same anthropological literature that MMT cites in support of its assertion that all money is credit and that's that. There's a nuance in that literature because Jeffrey Ingham, by the way, I've remembered his name. Jeffrey Ingham is the anthropologist who coined the word, the military coinage complex, right? He's, he's the guy who more than anybody else uh, developed the story uh, that I kind of told is the innkeeper story where the reason why people adopt money is because they have to pay taxes to the king. Um, not invented the story, but like, you know, he, he uncovered the anthropological evidence supporting it in part. But the same guy, Ingham, notes that the money that you gave to the soldiers had to be made of silver. It was very important that Alexander paid his soldiers in silver because silver was receivable in the territories that he was conquering. Why? Because what was going on in the Bronze Age where people used silver for payments between cities, right? International payments were made using weights of silver. These weights were not coins. They were not a single issuance with a standardized weight. It was bricks of silver and little clumps of silver. And they had these weights and, and measures where they had standardized uh, objects of a standardized weight. They would put on one end and they would put whatever your silver was on the other in order to weigh how much it was and therefore how much purchasing power it had on the international marketplaces. That's why in all those depictions of money in the ancient world, you always have like the, the two scale, the scale of weights. That's why. And that's also why, uh, um, Jesus uh, in the in the Bible story, uh, you know the the money changers with their with their weights. That's that's what he's the table that he's overturning. Um, so uh, the the there was a pre existing international means of payment from the Bronze Age, where people were used to making international payments in arbitrary weights of silver. The first coins 
were piggybacking off of that pre-existing system by paying soldiers in standardized weights of silver. So in other words, every coin has a certain silver content. And then when they go to the other territory, people accept it, not just because they have a tax obligation imposed upon them from the king, but because it's silver, which they already are used to for making international payments. So people, so in other words, even income, the source that Graeber uses and which, and the MMTers will tend to cite Graeber and Hudson, who both cite Ingham. He basically argues that the initial receivability of coins could not have been purely tax receivability. Now, tax receivability is in the mix here. Like, people do want the king's coin because the king will not just accept a lump of silver for payment. He wants his coins. So why use this silver instead of that silver is the tax receivability thing. But what drove the use of silver in these pre-existing international networks and, you know, made it so that people wouldn't just revolt against being forced to use this instrument was the fact that it was piggybacking off of the previous thing that they had been using to make international payments, which is weights of unworked metal. Um, so this is, this is really, I know that this is complex, but the reason why this is really important is because it allows us to do two things. One, it allows us to create an abstraction that uh, Steve and I, in our essay and in the book, we call it the international means of payment. Think of it as a synonym for Forex, but one that is trans-historical and trans, um, uh, you know, uh, like to a certain extent, transcultural. Um, like the, it, you can have an international means of payment, whatever it is that you use in order to get imports, right? Uh, or to pay somebody who's from another country. Um, you can you can have all sorts of instruments be the international means of payment. Uh, so in our era, it's the five reserve currencies. In Bronze Age Mesopotamia, it was weights of unworked metal. Um, in other places and times, it's been radically different things. It's uh, so, for example, uh, the the international means of payment has often been weights of silk or other worked over textiles, which they would put into these standardized clumps, uh, you know, which were all the same. And then you could use each clump as a unit and pay th and pay for things in that unit. In uh, West Africa, uh, the international means of payment between communities was copper bars, uh, and everything was priced in terms of copper bars. When the Europeans came by, they had to pay for local goods in copper bars, and the local good that they wanted most was slaves. And Graeber tells the story about how basically um, – the Europeans kind of like uh, uh, were able to uh, corner the market on copper bars and basically take the local economies that have been gift economies and turn them totally into factories for the production of slaves, essentially, uh, to be shipped off to the to the West. Um, and then uh, another great example, which is not in Graeber, which is in um, pretty much all the literature on the history of China, is the, the, uh, the, the tea bricks. So another international means of payment, specifically in the trade between China and what they called the Northern Barbarians, the steppe peoples of, uh, you know, Mongolia and other places in the north, uh, to the north of China that would often like conquer China. Well, they could conquer China so easily uh, all the time because they had really good horses and China had really shitty horses. So some very smart Chinese ministers in one of the dynasties, and I unfortunately forget which one, but it was medieval. Um, they, uh, they, they came up with this idea, China makes tea and everybody loves tea. So what if we package the tea into standardized bricks that have a particular weight and it's always the same quality and it's always this. And we, 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 uh, we basically price their commodities because they really want the tea. So we price all their horses and all the other things that we want from them in tea. So they'll give it to us in order to get the tea. Uh, this is not barter. This is an international price system in this particular trade network where the international means of payment is tea bricks. So you, as you can see, there are many possible international means of payment. Bills of exchange were another one. And, the inter and what you have is particular relationships either between different states or between different non-state actors reaching across borders who decide that they can pay each other 
in some means of payment. And it can be a commodity or it can be a fiat issuance. It can be pretty much anything as long as it's a standardized unit that they then like and anyone who wants to participate in that trade network uses that means of payment. And it's usually not just one. There's usually like a menu of them, much like our reserve currencies, right? So that's the first kind of like lesson that we can learn by going back in history, that there's this general abstraction um, the, the, that we can do called the international means of payment. And obviously, and this goes to your point, Varn, about imperialism, what the international means of payment is, is not just a technocratic decision, a decision that people make because of efficiency or whatever bullshit. It is a massive geopolitical and geostrategic uh, you know, uh, outcome. It is, in fact, one of the main things that imperialists fight over all the time. It is, it is, it is the kind of uh, economic fulcrum point of any system of countries or cultures that are in some kind of economic relationship with each other because it's what they use to pay each other and therefore what they can use to get things that they want out of each other. Um, who, whoever controls the international means of payment controls the trade network. That is basically uh, uh, a slogan that you can that you can utter. So who controls the international means of payment of the entire planet Earth? The Americans. That means that the US controls the global trade network. Um, this is the financial uh, instantiation of imperialism. This is what imperialism means in monetary terms. Uh, they, uh, obviously, imperialism has other dimensions, but if you look at it financially, that is basically how you do it. Um, so uh, uh, th that was the first lesson. The second lesson is that it explains the metal content of coins. Um, and, uh, this is where I think Colin Drum has been, uh, you know, in the comments, uh, writing all sorts of things. Um, uh, but the, the we're finally getting to uh, his work, which I'm sure is why he wanted to tune in in the first place. Um, we were very inspired by Colin's research, which we think is very rigorous and we think is correct on this point in particular. Um, coins are not just the price that the king sets through his taxes. Like, you know, why is a, why is the $10 coin worth $10? Because when you pay taxes, the, you, you get $10 of taxes paid uh, using it. That's the chartalist story, but that's not actually 100% true. That's what the coin is worth domestically. It is the nominal price of the coin, the legal price of the coin, which is ultimately set by the currency issuer, um, sort of. It's also set by anyone who sets prices in the coin um, in the local economy. But the coin has a second price. Because remember, we now know that part of the reason why the coins were made out of gold and silver is that they were piggybacking off of the pre-existing metal international system. That means that every coin not only has the legal price for when it's used domestically within the territory of the king who issued it, it also has a second price, which is the price that it gets on international markets. Now, this is really important. There's a quote from Graeber that I want to read to you that has, it's a very brief one, but it's, it's key. Quote, within the Roman Empire, a silver coin stamped with the image of Tiberius might have circulated at a value considerably higher than the value of the silver it contained. In other words, within the empire, it circulates at Tiberius's legal value. Ancient coins invariably circulated at a value higher than their metal content. This was largely because Tiberius's government was willing to accept them at face value. Face value is a synonym for legal value. However, the Persian government probably wasn't willing to accept it at its legal value in Roman terms. And the Mauryan and Chinese governments certainly weren't. Very large numbers of Roman gold and silver coins did end up in India and even China. This is presumably the main reason they were made of gold and silver to begin with. Now, this is a very confusing quote if you're a chartalist reading Graeber, but now I think you have some of the tools to understand what that means. Like the, the coins had a domestic value, which was set by Tiberius. But when the coins made their way over to India or to China, they didn't give a shit about that legal price. But you know what they did give a shit about? If you melt the coin down and make it a brick, that brick weighs something. And that is a weight of silver. And guess what all the international prices are priced in? Weights of silver. Ingot. 
Exactly. The and 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 in fact, what what's really interesting is that you know I'm kind of going back to the raw metals uh, thing of the Bronze Age, but in fact. What Colin Drum's research has uncovered is that all throughout the uh, the Axial Age, continuing through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, um, coins that had standardized weights of silver actually you wouldn't use gold ingots anymore. That was like an ancient, antiquated system. They were smart enough to realize, okay, the Romans are always trading with the Morians. The Romans always put this weight of silver in their coins. The Morians always put this weight of silver in their coins, right? That's standardized. So if it's standardized and they're always trading with each other, they can just trade coin like coins for each other because the coins have relative weights of silver. So three Roman coins have the same weight as one uh, Persian coin. I, I'm making this up, but like, you know, abstract, right? So guess what that is? One Persian coin equals three Roman coins. They are fractions of each other. It's an exchange rate. So you in the in Jesus' time, you wouldn't actually come in with the bricks of gold anymore. That was a Mesopotamian Bronze Age system. We're talking hundreds of thousands of years after. In Jesus' time, the coin. you come with Roman coins because you come from Rome. You go to Jerusalem. You swap them out for uh, Jerusalem coins. And there's a fixed exchange rate based on the relative quantities of the metal in them. This is also why... If you're the king, you don't want to devalue the coins. In other words, you don't want to reduce the silver content of your coins because that means that on international markets, they're worth less, which means right. that if you have a Roman coin, you have less purchasing power in Persia if the silver goes down than you had before. So this people who may listen to, to my work over the past, I don't know. 10 years have noticed I keep on going back to the crisis of the third century and the ancient Roman empire to explain modern stuff. Um, and everyone's always like, why do you do that? Well, I have this, I have this theory that, that, well, you have a hard time explaining why there wasn't capitalism at the end of the early modern period. I mean, the end of the late antique period, unless you start looking at stuff like coin values and the failure of uh, these coin values to actually work. And I could never square that with MMT um, because I'd be like, okay, but well, why was there a crisis of the third century if the Roman state could just be like, pay me more, bitches? <laughs> um, like, like I don't, I'm the one who says the currency terms, except that even in an empire as large as ancient Rome, they still had to trade with non Roman traders to get essential goods and they knew that they couldn't expand their supply lines anymore because there's just a natural limit to that when you're an ancient empire because supply lines have limits. Um, and so they couldn't continue to accumulate that way. And so it is no surprise then that the currency stuff becomes more and more important as the empire can't grow anymore. Um, and, I think, you know, this leads to a whole bunch of more complicated stuff that I literally have done, do a whole podcast series about with the regrettable century people, um, where we're looking at the work of Chris Rickham and eventually Samir Amin and others on this, but it, it perfectly dovetails with what you're saying. And finally, we have a theory that can tie all this together instead of one that jumps ad hoc between period to period to period, finding periods that where token money applies but can't explain either why all the current people in the world still peg their money to something or um, why the ancient world used so much uh, metal currency. Okay. Yeah. John Michael Carone died. All right. Um, he is in the restroom. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, um, I, when I look at the world reserve currency database and I see, okay, there's like five, I think the top, the top five reserve currencies account for something like almost 90% of, of circulation. Mm. And there's 195 countries. <laughs> there's like, okay, there's, um, even though it looks really one-sided, there are still countries that don't have reserve currency status, but produce things which imperial powers have no, I mean, they're not autark. No one, no country is an autarky. The Roman empire wasn't an autarky. And they, there was a breakdown in controlling the flow of goods and services that was reflected in 
currency destabilization. And so, like, if you have, um, it's just I'm sort of drawing parallels that perhaps they're not there, but between the reserve currency regime, the international means of payments in our like abstract sense between then and now. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's so interesting because, you know, there's a lot of dimensions to this that are unknown, um, but which suggest themselves from this more general framework that Steve and I have developed. Uh, for example, why was a gold standard so necessary for so long? Well, maybe part of the reason was technological. Now, we don't know this um, for sure. But there are at least some theories floating around. You know, the first time I heard this was in an informal conversation with Nathan Tankus, uh, like, you know, to give credit where it's due. I've also seen it implied in certain things that I've read. Just people will briefly touch on this point and then move away from it. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any text that explores it in depth. Uh, Tankus never wrote anything about it, and I don't know if anybody has written anything about it, but there is a theory or a fragment of a theory floating around the meme sphere that perhaps the reason why gold standards were so necessary for so long is technological. Like why can we do instantaneous transfers of money between countries? Because we have telecommunications technology, which allows you to quote prices, you know, like the, the, the price of one currency in relation to another instantaneously, everybody around the world can see it. And we have the ability to transfer funds from bank to bank, uh, which is usually like a ledger, you know, system that is shared between them and the international payment system. So uh, what happens before you have modern telecommunications? What happens when information travels at the speed of a donkey? Um, you can't have a system like that, right? <laughs> There's no instantaneous payments. And yet we had payment systems, including international ones. Why? Because with these structures, with these international means of payment that we had, whether they were commodities or whether they were uh, coins with metal content or whether they were uh, uh, issuances like bills of exchange, within the network and only within the network where it was deemed to be receivable, you could use them and you could generate local prices with them. Right, Because anybody who was in the network who received it, they were going to set the prices of their goods, like retail prices, right, in that thing. You can pay them this much of that thing for this, for this good or service. Um, so it created the ability. But I'm going to bet that the price of like that the, that the price of something in gold coins in one little town is not going to be the same price as the price of the same kind of product in a town that's like 50 miles away or even possibly 10 miles away. In other words, there was no standard price for that gold coin on international markets. There was only its relative price between one place in the network and another place in the network. Um, this, I, that's a very abstract and complicated point, but if this hypothesis is correct, um, you know, it would mean that floating exchange rates didn't even become possible until telecommunications technology made them possible, right? So that's another reason why it's not just foolishness that people had these pegs. Um, it was, uh, you know, the it was a technological limitation that was only very recently superseded in order to be able to create the modern international payment system. Again, hypothesis, nobody knows if this is true or not, but it gives you a sense of like, how a transhistorical general model might might uh, might help us make these hypotheses and then research whether they're true. So for my listeners, one thing that's going to come up in interviews throughout this week is there are material, but that we mean technological, social, biological, and environmental. And those are a lot of things. They're all material. There are material reasons for why humans do stuff. Um, and it's not just because we get weird ideas up of our ass. We do get weird ideas up our ass, but that's usually, they usually don't catch on. Um, if you've ever read uh, some micro history about fun things in the, in, in the late Middle Ages about people's, you know, beliefs about cosmology and worms and cheese for the car famous Carlo Ginsburg example, people have all kinds of ideas. They don't take off. Ones that take off tend to have a material reason for doing so. And this is, you know, one of my key points. Um, I didn't bring you on to like 
use you to redefine historical materialism in a more useful way. But, you know, that's a nice side effect of your thing here for my purposes. Ha, 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 ha. I mean, um, we did. Huh? It would be nice if somebody did redefine historical materialism. That's, that's not what we're up to just yet, but I agree. It would be nice if somebody did that. <laughs> this is sort of my project is uh, is like uh, making – like <laughs> make HM great again. Um, so uh, this – but in all seriousness, I think, I think we'd have to prove this or at least – actually, I don't think this can be proven. But we'd have to – we'd have to – make it probabilistically likely uh, that, that this was a technological argument by having more data, but it seems pretty viable that like metal is fairly consistent in its physical form and we can kind of semi standardize it, but the standards are probably not precise, right? As you said, and I'm guessing that's that we'll discover that even in times of relative um, price, you know, like the 19th century when Marx is writing, Colin Drum often makes this point a lot and got me thinking about like, why is there not really a theory of inflation and deflation in Marx? Um, is a period of like very stable prices um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but there's also stable pegs for things. Um, and it's a gold standard time. Um, and Marx actually writes, interestingly, in footnotes, and I've had MMTers attack him for this, about stuff like uh, the possibility of paper or paper credit money in like France and saying like, well, yeah, but it'll collapse because you can't trade stuff outside of France with it, more or less. Um, and it, it's interesting that this this comports with that. Like, but there, but we don't need gold anymore. And so the gold bugs, you know, I, I find the gold bugs fascinating because they're the, people don't know this when I talk about cryptocurrency, but cryptocurrency is deliberately energy consumptive and deflationary and deliberately inefficient to replicate gold. And it was designed by gold bugs 20 years ago. Um, and it was designed also because it, as it, it, it's, it's a store of value that's so deflationary that it actually is not useful for, for denominating anything, but, um, uh, and also very unstable and given to pump and dub schemes and this and the other, but it's, that's where it comes from. And what you're trying, what you're looking at there is technology trying to replicate this older form, but we don't need the older form anymore. Right. We don't need it in the first place. Right. I actually, I, well, I mean, if the theory is right, yeah, like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm punctuating this a theory because the truth, if the honest to god truth is, I don't know, and I'm just some guy from Jersey, right? Like, you know, so <laughs> what do I know? The, Everybody's uh, just some guy from somewhere, right? So, <laughs> actually, um, I'm curious what you think of the the idea of the technological limitations on the international means of payment. Um, that's uh, that that that's kind of my um little pet theory. Um, I don't know if we've talked about. It. I'm curious in your opinion. Uh, I'm pretty much in the same boat. I don't. I don't know for sure. Like we've had the development of telecom has like has um, ubiquitized like bill of exchange type things happening. So you have like netting balances between huge banks that um, they don't ever really need to interact with each other. They they net out their payments against one another each day, every day. Um, so, um, and yet they still have gold. Those yeah, even, banks, even Japan banks still, still have gold. Central banks so. all still have huge hordes of gold. Um, is that just a relic? It doesn't feel like it. Right. Um, in fact, uh, China, there was just news in the FT that China's hoarding gold. Yeah. And like, uh, Russia also. Yeah, in anticipation. They were anyway. They're using some of it up right as we speak, but they yeah. were. And and using it in anticipation of being shut out of the dollar system, countries abroad still receive gold for international payments. It's not the primary means by any stretch, but it's uh, they'll take it because Absolutely. if you want to be off the swift, it's gold a back is pretty option. useful. And yeah, it's, it's a back option. So I you mean, know yes, if someone just if someone just turns your swift account off then yeah, that's that's going to be very useful. And look, I used to be one of these dogmatic MMTers who would say, well, Bitcoin can never be money because uh, money is a, is by definition a centralized issuance that circulates and has its thing from tax receivability. Unless 
it becomes receivable as taxes somewhere. No one's ever going to want it, and they're not going to want it, uh, you know, anymore because like it being under the legal control of some government is counter is counterintuitive to Bitcoin's purpose. Therefore, Bitcoin can't work because it's rooted in a theory of money that is not true. Now, I think that elements of that are still true. I don't actually think that the um, you know they, they have barter theory like brain worms where they really do oh, think. Yeah. That you know, where they really do think that's just because something is scarce and just because, uh, you know, it, it has some kind of uh, use value or something like that, it, it, it can, through barter-like mechanisms, just become a general means of payment. That's not really true. However, the Forex theory has definitely convinced me that there is a path for crypto to become an international means of payment, particularly if some crypto, probably one that has a peg to some reserve currency that people actually want to get into, becomes a useful intermediary for getting into that currency, particularly for people shut out of the currency otherwise. Uh, that's, I know, a very abstract way of saying it, but let's say that like cryptos really helped you get into dollars, but you're shut out of the dollar system. Um, maybe you, you, you use a lot of that crypto, and then you pay agents in it, and who was on the other side of the payments anonymous enough that you can get stuff now, even though you're shut out of the system. That's potentially possible. I, there's a potential future for crypto as an actual means of payment and not just a speculative asset in Forex under certain scenarios. Like it, it would have to be a stable coin. It, it, would, it wouldn't be Bitcoin. It would I was be, about to say, uh, it, it would have to be something that doesn't act like crypto and also is it a massive energy suck. Well, that's but- I think that this notion that you create the artificial scarcity, I think mining is ridiculous. I mean, yeah, there yeah. must be some other way of doing the uh, the proof of work. Blockchain or- could be useful for, for an international exchange uh, um, thing, but mining coins is dumb. But so- there's an... There's a counter argument that says crypto will never be it, especially if mining is kind of baked into it in a way that there is no real alternative to it, because why burn energy uselessly doing this arbitrary encoding and decoding process when you could just use some commodity like in the actual world that also has like industrial uses like what if palladium were an international means of payment and were and you know and were and were bundled in like you know in in standardized bars and things like that uh I, I, you know why not just do that i mean it's old school but why not do it? And it's better than gold because it actually is industrially useful. You can use it to make semiconductors and shit. So why not do that? That seems it seems perfectly reasonable to me, especially since the original choice of silver in the Bronze Age system seems to have been its use value. The fact that you could use it to decorate the vestments of the of the priests and the temples and make the statue. You could like- use it without depleting it. That's like that's the more that's the more useful part. I mean, this is why metal. I think. I mean, this is this is actually classical economics, but it's why metal was often does seem to be like the more logical choice. Because say say you pay people in salt, which has happened. This right. Word salary. You eat the damn salt and it's gone. If you use silver, you can remelt it down. All right. Yep. So. And in fact, that's what people would do when their city was getting conquered and they needed to hire mercenaries to beat the invading army. All those beautiful sacred statues that, you know, were like people would worship the, at them in order to do test. They would think that it was the god actually there talking to them and all this stuff. I mean, what was sacred became profaned, as Marx would put it, because they would melt that shit down, turn into bricks, use it to be mercenaries and try to defend the city. <laughs> right. I mean, you know... I, I think uh, I mean Colin has convinced me that that Marx had an overly simplistic view, in which he inherited from Adam Smith about the origins of money, at least as he expresses it concretely in Capital Volume One. He throws off other stuff otherwhere. Marx does that that kind of thing, but uh, um, I I gotta say that some of the stuff about why metal was chosen that I've heard from standard economic people, when you look at it in the terms of credit coming first and barter's not involved, that stuff still makes sense. Like it's speculation. Some of the stuff we can't know, but yeah, I mean, uh, as, as I think Colin says in the, in the comments, um, metal has the lowest cost to change it from prestige, something you can use into uh, something, something transferable because melting isn't that hard to do and it's not going to destroy it. So, you know, um, 
Whereas, you know, you pay me in big rocks. Okay, people can't steal it, but I can't transfer it. You pay me in in uh, in food, I'm going to eat it, and it's just going to go away. And, you know, unless we start taking shit as currency, then that's not particularly useful. Also, it's, there's a bunch of reasons why poop doesn't work. So, I mean, there it's just... There's there are logical reasons why it makes sense, but I will say these are all just kind of deductions. Um, they're the most likely true thing, but we don't know. Um, and I don't some of the stuff I don't know how we'd ever know, but unless we find like a like some ancient uh, Lydian or Chinese book that's like this is why we did this. Have a nice day, which I don't think we're gonna find. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes you get close. Is uh, some of these like guides for rulers actually are just very concrete and blunt about it. But like uh, like Kautilya in India, for example, um, is a wonderful. He's the 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 he's the Machiavelli of the Indian subcontinent, except that he's also the Adam Smith. Wonderful, amazing book uh, he wrote called the Artha Shastra, which I'm not done with, but I'm like halfway through it, and it's just incredible. Everything from like how to do spies to how to do geopolitics to how to do money and how to manage the economy. It's like this this remarkable work, um, and you do get the juice in that. But you're right, like there there, there isn't there isn't always that juicy. Uh, you know, insider knowledge of it um, for different periods. It's we just have huge gaps. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you both for coming on. Stephen uh, will be back to talk about inflation in about a month because he's also got a new theory that gets us out of the push pull and monopoly uh, problems. For those of you who don't know about my explanations of classical understandings of inflation. Uh, which weirdly, even the classical understandings of inflation, push, pull, and monopoly problems are not usually how inflation is exploited. It's usually, I mean, explained. It's usually explained purely in terms of money supply, which makes no sense. Um, but whatever. Um, so, and Stephen will be turning to explain that to you. And hopefully that will be somewhat explanatory for another thing MMT has been trying to spin around on and these great debates between it and bastards like Larry Summers on the inflation problem um, in which I have come away thinking neither side knows what's going on. Um, so, uh, so uh, like to see back for that. And JMC will be back talking about other stuff uh, because I always recruit him. This is going to be our shortest podcast that we've done together at mere two hours and 15 minutes. Normally when JMC and I come on and we just love to talk about something, we'll talk for four hours. So, um, there is that as well. Um, related to today's podcast on Wednesday, it'll be posted in the evening, but I've been recording in the morning. I am talking to the host of What Is Politics about the anthropological selectivity of David Graeber and David Wingro on why they don't mention all this other material research and some of the stuff they talk about in the dawn of everything. Um, and uh, we will also be talking about some other stuff, but that's going to be the primary topic. So it's directly related to this. I'm not here to to crap on David Graeber. I think David uh, David Graeber's work actually is super important to my own intellectual development. But we we also have to, in some ways, bury our heroes, um, particularly when we can't fight them on Twitter. So um, there is that. So I'd like to thank you both for coming on and. Uh, I hope you both have a good evening in this interesting time that we're living in. Um, may this time get no more interesting in the next two weeks. So yeah. um, before we before we cut, can we just uh, do a little pitch for our? Um... Of course you can. Awesome. So Steve, wanna... yeah. So our fund crowdfunding fundraiser is tomorrow. Uh, it will be going all day, and it will go through March. And look for a link for that on our Twitter handle at strange underscore matters. Um, I'm actually wearing one of the um, merch items right now. So you can get a shirt if you want. You can subscribe uh, to digital or print. Uh, yeah, we plan to, we plan to be getting print issues out quarterly. Eventually uh, we issue one is done. You can buy that. You can buy our merch. You can donate whatever amount you want. Uh, every little bit helps, and if you have, if you can't manage 
a donation, sharing, and liking it helps too. Absolutely. I mean, we started the magazine not just to talk about this Forex stuff. It's just one of many, many things that we have. But it, Forex, the Forex theory is an example of the kind of paradigm shift that we want the magazine to focus on pushing. Across intellectual disciplines, in both the social sciences and the arts, there is a need for new ways of thinking about fundamental problems that get past the kind of impasses and the stuckness of our culture and our uh, and our models of the world. Because we need to develop tools by which we can do things like a green transition or do things like the creation of a radically democratic international culture or do things like run industry uh, in a, as a democracy of workers and run cities as democracies of their citizens. But we don't know how to do that. We don't have the tools yet for how to do that in a practical level. Uh, we have some theories, we have some frameworks, we have some stuff that's kind of hunches in the right direction, but we don't actually have the tools that we need. And the only way that we can build those tools is by having these democratic and intellectually humble conversations where we try to work it out together across lines of difference. So if that's something that you believe in, please check out at strange underscore matters uh, or sign up at tiny URL, um, dot com slash strange matters which takes you to our indiegogo uh the the campaign is going to be going live tomorrow at around noon and um the we we hope that you can donate and if not that you can spread the word because if you agree with uh with the 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 general mission of the magazine which i think any right-thinking leftist should uh then like help us build that better world together because we can't do it alone. We don't have the answers, but we can build a space where we're together. We can work out what those answers might be. All right. Um, and I will end us on that thought. Um, also with the paradox and contradiction of a right thinking leftist. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, with that note, thank you guys. We're going to end with the cool calm transition out today. Um, and we will see you both again on the show in the coming months.